Hi, thanks for watching. Okay, so in this video, I'd like to talk about um, something that I feel is very important in the area of cluster B, narcissism, NPD, and uh, maybe even addictions, uh, kind of that whole kind of cluster of, um, you know, psychological issues. Um, and that is the importance of emotions, okay? And the idea of being open to emotions and having uh, sort of an open flow of emotion, okay? I think we have this idea in psychology, um, which may be partially true, maybe partially true that, you know, basically the, the barometer of our health is how open we are to our emotions and that, you know, more open openness in our emotional experience will sort of um, result in sort of like a catharsis, sort of like a purging. And the idea is that that's kind of like, um, you know, sort of like important to being healthy, you know, sort of having open emotions. Okay. Um, I do want to challenge that just a little bit. Okay. Now I think to some extent, I think that may be true. Okay. But I think, like as with a lot of things in psychology, I think there's another factor that I think we need to take into account. In other words, there may be something else going on, you know, in the context of emotion that depending on how that other thing is set up, okay, that's going to determine how healthy our emotions are. So I guess what I'm suggesting is that there may be something in addition to the emotion, okay, that we need to pay maybe more attention to that may help us determine um, a little more like how, how healthy we are actually, or how, how much better we're getting in life. Okay. In terms of like recovery or just, just our mental health. Okay. So I don't look at it just in terms of how open our emotions are. Okay. And I don't really look at emotions as like the cornerstone or the core uh, or the most important aspect of mental health. Okay. I think now, yeah, I think if our emotions are not open, I think that's a sign. That's a sign that there are some issues. But I think there's something even deeper than than the the actual emotions that that may real be the, be the real determinant of of how healthy uh, we are um, psychologically. Okay, so basically, um, I just want to challenge everyone to think. You know, yeah, emotions. I mean, I have respect for emotions too, but not necessarily to assume that emotions are like at the bottom bottom. The, the actual foundation of mental health. There may be some other issues, okay, going on that are even deeper than the emotions, okay? And I think I just challenge, you know, people, I'm mean, just to consider it, just to consider this. Like, you know, I may be wrong, but I think it's, it's often healthy just to consider possibilities, okay? Because that, that's how we expand our, our awareness and stuff. So just to consider that maybe uh, even more foundational than our emotional state, okay, is our attitude state. Okay, the deepest attitudes and outlook states like, you know, how do we fundamentally feel about the world? How do we fundamentally um, engage? How do we what is our attitude in our um, how would you say what is our deepest attitude and outlook about our place in the world and how we f see ourselves in the world or against the world? OK, I think that may be actually more profound than actual the, the actual emotional level. Okay. So basically what am I talking about here? All right. I think there are basically, I think two basic states in terms of our attitude, um, that we can have as, as we deal with our, our experience in life. Okay. There's just basic two basic attitudes and within those two basic attitudes, there's, there's different, there's different flavors within those two basic attitudes, but basically, you can have a basic attitude uh, in dealing with whatever comes up in our lives, okay, of more or less acceptance, okay, more or less acceptance. Like, it's not to say that you approve with, of what's happening, okay? So there may be terrible things happening, like say there may be a fire that destroys a house, okay? Um, it's nothing good. You may have lost a family member, let's say, in a fire, all right? But some people will sort of say, okay, well, that happened you know, and somehow they take the pain, they take the hit, you know what I mean? And other people, they sort of don't ever seem to really take the hit. It's like, they don't really want to let it fully hit them. So it's kind of like, they know it happened. And I think we've all seen this, you know, where let's say there's been, let's say a suicide in the family. Imagine there's been a suicide in the family and there's one person in the family who just doesn't want to talk about it, you know? And it's almost like you get the feeling like they haven't fully, they don't really want to deal with it. They don't really want to accept it. Okay. It's like too much to, to hit them. And so it's like, in a sense, below their emotions, there's sort of an attitude that hasn't fully accepted 
what has happened. Okay. And again, I want to make very clear that acceptance is not an approval. It's not saying you like what happened. It's not saying that you think it's good. Acceptance is more just taking the hit, you know, taking the hit. And I think a lot of us um, in our own lives and in our families, I think we know we've seen examples of people who throughout certain experiences in life, they don't they don't want to fully take the hit of, of what's happening around them or at least certain certain things that are happening. OK, and I understand some things that happen in life can really hit us hard. OK, so by no means am I saying this is easy or this is trivial. It's not trivial. It's not easy, but it is a distinction. OK. And I think there is a distinction between uh, a basic attitude of at least accepting reality as it is, however bad it may be, and then just kind of not wanting to take the full hit of what's really happening or not wanting to take the full scope of what's happening because it's like an overload and you just kind of want to selectively or just not take it all, you know? Okay. So basically I look at that as the basic division, basic distinction between an attitude of basic acceptance of reality and an attitude maybe of selective acceptance of reality, where we just kind of selectively take the hit on some things, but don't take the hit on everything. So it's basically, you can either fully accept reality or, or you just sort of don't fully accept reality, sort of partially accept reality. You only accept the things that, that you feel like that don't hurt you too much or that don't cause a lot of problem. All right. So basically it's sort of like, um, it's basically the spectrum of acceptance. Okay. So that's kind of like an emotional you know, layer basically. And then if anything, we can maybe describe maybe another aspect kind of related to acceptance, which is welcome and welcome. I want to be so careful because it's not, again, it is not to say that you approve of what's happening. It's not to say that you like what's happening or that you think it's good what's happening, but in a sense, kind of like say, take the worst example. Let's say if I lost a family member in a fire, Okay. In, in their house or whatever, something terrible, something awful. Okay. And I mean, you know, it's one thing to accept and to take the hit. Okay. But what would it mean to say, welcome, welcome that, that experience. And, you know, even I have to even kind of wonder like, is welcome the best, um, well, you know what, let's, let's talk about welcome. I, I think there's a way we can make this work. Okay. Because it's, again, it's not, it's not saying you like it. It's not saying that you approve of what's happening. It's not saying that it's pleasant, but it's almost like you welcome, you welcome the hit, you welcome the pain because philosophically, you know, that it has to be gotten through. You have to get through it. You know, it's like you take it on. Okay. Because you know, there's no other option than to just get through it. Okay. So that's kind of maybe not the welcome that we're used to talking about because I, th I think most of welcome is like oh this is great this is great welcome but it's 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 a kind of philosophical welcome where it's more than just accepting okay but it's also taking it in because you know there's no other way except through processing okay so yes um in the, in the case of like say somebody dying or somebody committing suicide in your family or something like that it's not like oh this is great let's just take it on it's more like just it's not just acceptance but it's just literally letting it in and letting it in willingly and and i guess maybe that's the sense of welcome is letting things come into you even though they're extremely painful okay because there's no other way to get through them there's no other way to process them okay and and remember that if you know if we don't process fully the circumstances of our, of our environment, of our, of our life, you know, if we don't fully process those become kind of like fragmented, fragmented, unintegrated parts of us. And they're going to become more unmanageable to the extent that we don't fully process them. Okay. So let's say you look at the case of Rex Hewerman, you look at the case of, let's say the, um, Chris Watts, you know, the, both of these guys had issues with sexuality. Okay. And maybe a lot of things about sexuality that were just so uncomfortable, they probably just didn't want to fully process them. OK, I imagine a guy like Chris Watts, you know, he just kind of went through his day to day. He probably wasn't very happy in his marriage. And, you know, he had a lot of issues with his wife, a lot of issues with the finances. But I don't think he fully just took it in. OK, I think he was just irritated. I think he was just uncomfortable. And so he did anything but process and fully accept, you know, the, the, how uncomfortable it was being in that marriage at a point where he was really, let's say in fundamental disagreement with his wife 
And he was even seeing like maybe she had habits of spending or habits of getting into debt that he just did not agree with, you know. So that's that's leaving out. That's even let's say before, let's say the the relationship he had with Nicole Kessinger. Right. I mean, the thing with Nicole Kessinger, that just blew up the marriage. But let's just say leading up to it, there were already some, you know, um, systematic sort of structural problems with the marriage and maybe some things that really deeply bothered uh, Chris. But he didn't have, let's say, the emotional depth the depth to sort of take in and take in and sort of maybe just metabolize all the the uncomfort the discomfort of of you know being in a marriage with somebody who didn't have the same values it didn't have the same sense of uh, managing money or debt or whatever you know and that could be a lot of problem and it's not to say that maybe this couldn't have ended in a divorce but in a healthy divorce where they could just put on the table that they disagree. And maybe Chris could say, look, I've, I've let it into my stomach. I've, I've felt this. I've tried, you know, to deal with it, but, but I feel like deep down inside of me, I cannot continue to be married to somebody where we have these fundamental differences about debt, about money, but that would be a very mature conversation. That would be, um, that'd be a different Chris, Chris Watts, right? Cause he wasn't, I don't think he was fully taking all that in. I think he was just, I think he was just irritated, you see? And so, you could say that being irritated, that's an emotional state, right? But it's an emotional state that is not in openness. It's not in acceptance and it's not in welcome taking it in. You see what I mean? So it's in a sense, it's kind of an avoidant state. And I guess the suggestion I'm making is that even if, if um, let's say, take someone other than Chris Watts, because Chris Watts wasn't even really a very emotional person, but there are people who have extreme emotions, extreme emotions but it's all around the attitude of not accepting, okay? And not welcoming, okay? And how many times have we seen that where a person is all hysterical and upset and upset and upset about things, but it's it's because precisely they're not taking it in. You see what I mean? Imagine somebody, let's say a mother who loses their son, let's say in a, in a fire, okay? With the, the house burns down and the son is killed, okay? Now that's that's bad. That's very bad. And, you know, I shouldn't, we shouldn't judge anybody for not being able to fully process that, right? But let's say, let's take a mother who gets real hysterical about it. And instead of fully processing that she's lost her son and that there was an accident and taking the grief and really letting it hit her, you know, because there's no other way around it, she gets all upset because, well, but what about the electrical, the bad electrical? You know, my son was renting from a, from a derelict, uh, um, landlord and the landlord couldn't have, couldn't bother be bothered to spend the extra fifteen hundred dollars to rewire the the apartment and so it's it, goddamn that landlord and and investing all the energy in this kind of rage and this kind of uh, you know like like uh, hysterical emotion but almost because she doesn't want to focus on the grief on accepting the grief. So in a sense, all the outrage and all the upsetness, it's kind of like a, um, a displacement of attention. So you don't have to take the gut punch of, I lost my son. You know what I mean? I mean, I'm just, I'm just putting it out there now, not to say you can't have both, right. You can also be upset at the, at the landlord and, you know, have issues with, you know, my, my son was renting a defective apartment with electrical problems, whatever. I understand both of those things, but sometimes people get so invested in the outrage, because it's kind of like a way of not having to go to the dead center and take in the pain of what happened, right? So I, I'm just saying that, you know, in life, you can often see people who are way emotional, really upset, or let's say, let's take a, let's take a wife who gets always angry at her husband, always angry at her husband, because he's, he doesn't pay attention. He's, he's distracted. He, um, he just, let's say a husband that, um, that works too much and, you know, doesn't have enough attention to the family and maybe forgets to do things around the house and just really upset, really upset, really upset. But sometimes just getting upset, upset at the bottom, bottom, there's no, let's say acceptance of the situation. Okay. That my, my husband has a lot of work and maybe he maybe isn't the most superhuman person. Maybe he only has limited attention and, and yeah, I'd like to see him get better, but is it really going to help my husband get better if I just throw fireworks of getting upset all the time? Maybe if I were to calm down myself and just take in the situation, the discomfort of the situation, just let it sit, let it hit me in the stomach, let it process instead of just having all these fireworks reactions and just, just reacting and, and stirring the pot, I might be able to then sit down like Chris Watts should have done and have that gut level conversation where it's not just a bunch of avoidance and a bunch of, you know, 
I don't know, just anything but taking the hit. You know what I mean? So yeah, in Chris, in Chris Watts case, he just wasn't a very emotional person. That's true. But he wasn't, um, he was, he was irritated though. He was irritated at his wife. And I don't know if he just fully took it in to just sit down and not be antsy and not go looking for another relationship and just take it up, take the hit, take the uncomfort and just sit down with his wife and try to have those seriously, you know, stomach wrenching conversations, you know, uh, without all the, let's say the avoidance and the, I think in a way, Chris, his way of being, um, his way of being um, hysterical was not emotionality, like overt emotionality, but I think he became kind of like, uh, kind of ADD, kind of like, like, uh, like itchy, like he got kind of like, um, how would you say kind of hyperactive a little bit, you know, like when people are uncomfortable, like he, he was uneasy, uneasy. And I think that made him a sitting duck to get into a, a side relationship, you know, like a, like a, an affair basically. Um, and if it wasn't with Nicole Kessinger, it might've been with somebody else because he was just, he was itchy. He was, he was, he was just not feeling at ease, you know? And I think, um, you know, instead of having that kind of, let's call it almost like a hysterical reaction, you know, the alternative would have been to take the full hit in the stomach of, you know, I'm with a woman, I'm, I'm married and I have kids and we have some fundamental constitutional disagreements about how to handle finances. And in some ways, maybe Chris was maybe too conservative. You know, maybe he should have found a way to maybe not so be so tense about money, maybe learn how to take a risk with some debt to a point, maybe a happy medium between, let's say, what was comfortable for Shanann and maybe find, like, say, a middle ground, you know. But the bottom line is you can't even begin to have that conversation if you don't sort of uh, to have an attitude of an acceptance, you know, basic acceptance and then welcome the situation. Because if you don't welcome the situation, invite it in to sit, it's just going to become like fragmented. Um, it's going to become like fragmented, not processed, basically. And then instead of having an integrated experience, all these different like hangups that you have, they're going to become like satellite parts of you that have that are not managed. They're not uh, they don't whenever you your whenever your psychology gets into like satellites that are not processed in the center. You, you become sort of um, like a, you become sort of like a solar system where you have like disembodied planets orbiting around and it's much harder to manage. It's better to get everything inside inside and process than just to have everything just just chaotically orbiting. OK, so basically my suggestion is that you can be extremely emotional. You can be extremely emotional in, a, in an attitude of non-acceptance. OK, you can be extremely um like Chris Watts, he, he had his way of being emotional where he didn't express it, like, say, in the typical way of being emotional, but he got kind of uh, hyperactive, kind of um, he, he got into a state where he was kind of uneasy, uncomfortable, sort of not 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 at peace, basically. And that put him as a sitting duck to get into like a relationship with somebody else and just do stupid things, you know. But the bottom line is that um, we can have a lot of emotional states, OK, in the position of not fully accepting everything that's happening around us. Okay. Or not welcoming what's happening around us to be processed. Okay. And I'm guilty as anybody. All right. I have that problem. I, I, I was, unfortunately, I was raised in an environment of emotional poverty um, where we were impoverished in the sense of, you know, very poor emotional uh, maturity. Uh, psychologically, we were just not very uh, mature people, our family, you know? And so I grew up in a situation where, the, the ways that we coped with, uh, you know, not feeling, let's say not being comfortable. There was a lot of emotionality in my house, but it was that unhealthy emotionality of just getting angry and just, um, you know, sort of confronting and, and just not taking on very much and just, and just being kind of spoiled, you know? And so, um, you know, I've been around and I've seen my mother, my mother would just get so emotional, you know? Um, but there was never a feeling in the house in my family where I'm from, you know, of people like say taking and accepting and welcoming it was always just kind of reacting and not tolerating um our, our circumstances you know so so basically um i just encourage people to um you know not be satisfied just by the question of how emotional a person is okay that's not the bottom line okay i don't i don't find that to be the bottom line it's my opinion right but i don't i don't think the bottom line is how emotional we are i think the bottom line has to do with a basic taking in 
okay, at the gut level, the gut level, maybe not even the heart, maybe the gut, <laughs> taking in the gut punch of how maybe unpleasant things are around us, okay, and nevertheless having a sort of a general attitude of acceptance so that we can process those things in our psychological center and, and really, let's say, really integrate those things, you know. And in order to do that, there has to be a welcoming in. And welcoming in is not not the thing is not a situation of where you approve of what's happening, where you think it's good. It's just that things have to be welcomed in in order to not be processed out as satellites. OK, and I think we've seen in the case of Rex Heuerman and the case of Chris Watts, when when real big issues of, like, say, sexuality, relationships, um, you know, basically my identity as a man in relationship to women or sexuality, whatever, if that doesn't all get processed deep down inside, OK, um, these things will become fragmented satellites, okay? And they'll be much more difficult to manage, okay? Much more difficult to manage. So like in the case of Chris Watts, he had a relationship with Shanann. That was his relationship, you know? That was his present situation, you know? And in a sense, he was kind of not fully dealing with it and then sliding off into another thing. So his basic sexuality kind of dislodged from his center and it became sort of like a, a disembodied satellite basically. And you see how easy that was for him to manage, you know, same thing with uh, Rex Hewerman, you know, he maybe never dealt with the gut punch, the gut punch that, yeah, maybe I'm six foot four, maybe I'm a big guy, but maybe girls don't like me. Maybe I'm not that attractive, but he has a wife, right? And she's maybe not the most attractive person, but Hey, I've got my family. I've got my wife. That's my sexuality. That's my situation whether I like it or not, maybe it sucks. Maybe, maybe deep down inside, I have fantasies of a better sexuality, but instead of taking the gut punch and feeling like shit. Okay. And just letting that process with welcome, there may have been a wonderful life that he could have had that he couldn't even imagine because he never let it process. He never, he never allowed it in, you know what I mean? And so he became a raving maniac, basically a homicidal maniac. And, and, uh, I'll bet you if you were to if you were to honestly talk to Rex Hewerman like in prison right now, he might have a lot of difficulty actually talking about that because it, it, probably for him it was a kind of almost like a dis, disembodied entity. And we can remember with Ted Bundy, um, he often remarked to I think psychologists and to his attorneys that the person that killed the part of him that killed was like an entity. It was like a separate part of him. Okay, so you can see that. Um, you know, some terrible things can come out of not just basically in life, just dealing with the sort of the discomforts and the, the difficult gut punches that life brings to us, you know. And um, so I so I guess the whole point of this is that, you know, I, I personally and this is just my opinion, but I'm personally not satisfied with just how emotional a person is. OK, or how open they are to emotions. To me, the more fundamental question with people is a question of how accepting they are of, of the full the full gut punch of the circumstances around them, okay? And then welcoming that in to be processed, you know, not saying that you approve of it, not saying that you think it's good, but just letting in everything, no matter how good or bad, because otherwise, if it doesn't get processed in our gut center, things become sort of satellite and much, you know, our personality is not integrated, you see? And uh, I guess the other thing I want to say is on the area of empathy. Empathy is kind of similar. You know, empathy is kind of an emotionality. If, if we define empathy as just being, oh, I feel what other people feel, if it's no more than that, okay, well, that's a very primitive empathy, okay? And that doesn't really tell you if a person has, let's say, a mature uh, sense of acceptance in the world, all right? And so... Um, when I look at empathy, um, I'm not looking so much at whether a person can feel what other people are feeling. OK, I'm looking more at whether a person can really understand and meaningfully understand the realities of other people. OK, I think that's the that's the empathy we should be looking for, whether a person can, yes, understand what other people are feeling, not necessarily feeling what they're feeling, but understand what they're feeling and put it into a meaningful perspective. OK, because that's taking in the reality, right? You have to have an, an acceptance of reality to fully, fully see in the full flesh the realities of other people and take it in. You see what I mean? So that that empathy to me is more about acceptance and welcoming of, a, of an environmental situation as opposed to, oh, I just feel what they feel. 
You see what I mean? And I think we just need to be careful because I think too easily we define empathy. There's so many ways to define empathy, but I think we define it just as, oh, I feel what they feel. They feel, I feel. It's like, okay, but, you know, that could be potentially not necessarily a very mature uh, position. You know what I mean? And it might be a much more mature position to, to develop that ability to take in and accept maybe even difficult aspects of reality and then welcome those things into our gut center, right? And then develop a, a meaningful, comprehensive understanding of other people where we really, you know, have a, have a, a rich understanding of other people because we're allowing a lot of maybe unpleasant things or things that are not necessarily preferential to us to actually come in and, you know, hit us in the gut and take up space in our gut, you know? Um, so anyway, uh, basically, um, you know, you know, I'm not, I'm not here to put down emotions. Um, I'm not here to say that emotions are not important, but what I'm saying is that the, how open a person is to emotion, how emotional to me, that, that is not for me, the fundamental question. Um, when I'm looking at mental health, the, you know, when I'm looking at mental health, the deepest question for me is that fundamental attitude the fundamental attitude and posture of a person below the level of emotion, which is basically that difficult letting in the gut punches of, do I accept the whole comprehensive aspects of, uh, of reality around me, even the things that really bother me, you know, how much does a person fully accept their, their, their environment, their environmental circumstances? And then how much do we actually welcome that in to get processed deep inside of us? You know, so, to me, that that posture, that attitude is actually more fundamental than a person's emotionality. And I think uh, if we want to talk about catharsis, maybe in my in my opinion, we should talk more about integration and actually taking things in and letting them metabolize and integrate. You know, catharsis is always presented as kind of like a release, kind of like a kind of like a, an escape valve, you know, kind of like flushing, flushing things and sort of cleaning the pipes, let's say. Whereas, and maybe a little bit of uh, synthesis, but, but I look at synthesis as more of a slow metabolizing process that is not necessarily such a fast, um, you know, magical thing. It's more just like the, the long enduring marathon of just um, taking things in and letting them work inside of us, you know, uh, metabolizing, you know, so, so yeah, so maybe uh, a little less catharsis, a little more metabolization. And then, uh, you know, the most important thing for me is just, you know, the acceptance, the level of acceptance and taking in and welcoming the content of the world around us into us. And I think those are things that really eliminate, kind of dissolve the ego and really address the, the problem with narcissism, which is where we become sort of, sort of separate from our environment because we're, we don't have that ventilation where we're letting things in and we don't have the attitude to really open ourselves and let things in. So it, it really, to me, the attitude is not just openness, or I should say it's not just acceptance, but it's also that welcome, like welcome in the content of the outside, no matter how bad it is, just because there's no alternative. There's no other way around it, except to turn everything into satellites, which is much more difficult to manage. So it's better just to let horrible things in and suffer them because we know that that will pay off better in the end, even though it hurts and it takes a lot of courage. But I think that that level of courage uh, in facing the world, that attitude of acceptance and welcome, to me, that's more fundamental than how emotional we are or how open we are to emotions. So anyway, appreciate you guys listening and thanks for watching.